to approach renal failure. I'll be talking about acute kidney injury and uh, how to differentiate between pre-renal, post-renal, intra-renal causes of acute kidney injury and how to kind of differentiate some of the causes within those subcategories as well. So let's get started. First, acute kidney injury is a sudden um, significant increase in creatinine or decrease in urine output. So um, first thing we always check is if it's pre-renal. Um, this is an easy blood test to do. If it's pre-renal, you'll look at the BUN to creatinine ratio as well as the urine sodium and the fraction of excreted uh, sodium. <clears throat> and then if that's negative, then you move on to post-renal. You can do some imaging to take a look at the urinary tract and you usually do ultrasound so you don't blast them with radiation. And if it's not post-renal, then you can consider intra-renal uh, injury, which gets a little more complicated and I'll kind of break that down into different sections. So uh, let's first take a look at this picture of the urinary tract and we're going to color code. So we'll make this picture black and white and then we'll color code it according to the areas affected. Um, by pre-renal, post-renal, or intra-renal injury. So pre-renal largely affects the uh, vasculature in the body, so you know aorta, blood vessels, um, renal artery, so that's important to know. The intra-renal, uh, as the name implies, affects the kidney itself, and the post-renal affects the ducts after the kidney, so the ureter, the bladder, or the urethra after the kidney. So that's just kind of visual to you know get you oriented to what we're talking about. So, okay, as I mentioned, <clears throat> first thing you want to do is these blood tests and urine tests to see if it's pre-renal failure. So pre-renal failure is pretty distinct from intra-renal and post-renal failure in that the urine osmolality will be very high. It'll be above 500, you'll have very low urine output. Um, whereas in these, um, you might have, you know, moderately high uh, urine osmolality, but not quite this high. The BUN to creatinine ratio is always the big tip off for me. That's usually equal to or above 20. Whereas in these, it's you know low or low normal. Um, the reason for this is that water is retained because you have high activation of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Uh, when that happens, the BUN is reabsorbed. So BUN is high in the blood. Creatinine is not reabsorbed. <clears throat> so creatinine ends up being peed out. BUN is not peed out. So in the blood, what you're left with is a high ratio of BUN to creatinine. The urine um, sodium levels are typically low. What's more helpful is the fractional excretion of sodium. That's very low, less than 1%. Whereas in these other disorders, it's usually above 1% or even high in intrarenal. So know that in pre-renal um, azotemia, you have high urine osmolality, uh, low urine sodium, and a high BUN to creatinine ratio. Um, so yeah, those are the things I just mentioned. Great. So. Um, when you're considering pre-renal causes of uh, kidney failure, you want to look at causes of low perfusion. And there's a lot of things that can cause this. It could be shock for a number of reasons. It could be blood loss. It could be cardiogenic shock. It could be um, infection, septic shock. Um, volume depletion is another thing that does it. So diarrhea, dehydration, hemorrhage, excessive vomiting, cirrhosis, um, nephrotic syndrome. Congestive heart failure can do it as well. Um, if the heart isn't pumping blood and the kidney responds by increasing the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system um, they just the kidneys might not be getting enough um, enough enough blood to to perfuse them sufficiently adrenal insufficiency can do it and uh, renal artery stenosis can do it you can also have hepatorenal syndrome when the um, splanchnic arteries dilate they kind of carry a lot of blood there and there's less blood going to the kidneys so the kidneys aren't being well perfused um, all of those are things you should consider. They're all causes of decreased perfusion um, that lead to pre-renal azotemia. The treatment for this is to fix the problem of low perfusion. Oftentimes, something you can try is IV fluids, or um, if they have lost fluids, or diuretics if they have too much fluid and the heart isn't able to handle it, for instance. Um, but yeah, usually adjusting their fluid status can help with pre-renal azotemia. Next is post-renal. So with post-renal azotemia, you're gonna, again, do imaging. We prefer ultrasound to CT scans. And if the imaging is positive, if you see hydronephrosis, which is uh, too much fluid in the kidney, or hydroureter, which is too much fluid in the, in the ureters, then you consider a post-renal obstruction. Now, a lot of things can obstruct the, um, the, the tubes after the kidney. Among them are stones, cancer, BPH, which would be in the urethra, um, congenital anomalies, a neurogenic bladder could do it, for instance, in a diabetic who isn't able to contract their bladder, um, that can back up into the kidneys. A kinked obstructive catheter could also be in there and um, bent in a way that, that blocks the outflow of urine. 
So those are all possibilities. The treatment here is usually an intervention. You go in and fix it. Um, so they might need a catheter to, you know, overcome the excessive BPH. They might need nephrostomy if the kidney is uh, blocking things. They might need a stent. They might need surgery. So this is oftentimes a urology consult. Lastly, intrarenal. This is a little more complicated. If you've ruled out prerenal, if you've ruled out postrenal, now you're looking at intrarenal. Uh, this is damage to the renal parenchyma. So oftentimes we start by doing a urinalysis and look for casts. Um, could do a biopsy, but that's pretty invasive to start. So let's start with this urinalysis and look for casts. Depending on the kind of cast you get, it kind of puts you in different buckets as to what this can be. So let's first start with these red blood cell casts. Um, these are indicators of glomerulonephritis, which is what I put here. Great. So um, one thing that can cause this, so when, when, you're, when you see red blood cell casts, you want to check for nephrotic syndrome. Um, that would be 3.5 grams of protein in the urine uh, over 24 hours, uh, oftentimes with hyperlipidemia, oftentimes with edema. If you don't have nephrotic syndrome, consider glomerulonephritis. There are a number of causes of glomerulonephritis. These are some of the common ones and some associations that are worth knowing for them. You can have lupus nephritis, in which a person will have lupus symptoms, you know, like uh, deficiencies in blood cells and the malar rash and arthritis. Um, and they can also have a positive AMA, a positive DS DNA. So typical uh, lupus um, lab values. IgA nephropathy, nephropathy is often common after a respiratory or GI in a viral infection. So this will often happen like three to five days after having a, a cold or just, you know, benign infection. A um, person will have bloody um, urine and uh, that'll be IgA nephropathy. HSP, heinoch schleinen purpura, this is IgA vasculitis. This is post-viral. Um, it could be post-viral, but it's also a systemic vasculitis um, that people will get. It can be associated with a rash, with um, arthritis, and uh, uh, it's also prevalent in kids. Anti-GBM disease, formerly called good pasture disease. This is glomerular basement membrane disease. The problem here is uh, antibodies that end up in the kidney and also in the lung. So they'll have hemoptysis, bleeding from the lung. They'll have hematuria, bleeding from the kidney. Um, and yeah, that's how you differentiate good pasture syndrome. Next is granulomatosis with polyangitis. That's formerly known as Wegener's granulomatosis, or sorry, Wegener's glomerulonephritis. This will have manifestations in the sinus, in the kidney, and in the lungs. So again, hemoptysis and hematuria. This is a positive ANCA vasculitis, so that's one way to differentiate it. Last one is eosinophilic GPA. So eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly called Churg-Strauss, um, similar to Wegener's, but with asthma, uh, which makes sense because it's eosinophilic. So those are all glomerulonephritides that are related to having red blood cell casts when you suspect intrarenal injury. If instead you see muddy brown casts, those usually correspond to epithelial cells in the tubes, and um, that could be a sign of acute tubular necrosis. Now, acute tubular necrosis is usually caused by ischemia or toxins, um, so ischemic damage to the kidneys or uh, toxic medications or drugs to the kidneys. This causes the tubules to necrose and the epithelial cells die and slough off. There's three different phases of this. Um, sometimes it's hard to kind of differentiate between these phases, but at first there's a prodrome where the creatinine is high and there's normal urine output. Then there's an oliguric phase where the urine output drops and the creatinine is still high. Then there's a polyuric phase where all of a sudden the urine comes out really fast. Um, not sure if that's important to know, but that might be a pattern that you see. The toxins that are potentially causing acute tubular necrosis are aminoglycosides, statins, cisplatin. A lot of medications can do this. Um, the other common ones that you see are like myoglobin in a patient that has rhabdo. So if there's somebody who's like a chronic alcohol user and passes out, um, comes in peeing blood, that'd be something to suspect. It's not necessarily medications that they take. It could also be myoglobin from their own body, from their own muscles. Um, contrast, if this is a you know, iatrogenic cause, somebody's getting a lot of CT scans, they might have a contrast-induced acute tubular necrosis. Ethylene glycol, often in um, alcoholics, again, people who drink uh, alcohol, can't find alcohol, they end up taking ethylene glycol. Poisons and heavy metals can do this too. Uh, one way to prevent contrast-induced ATN, contrast-induced acute tubular necrosis, is to hydrate the patient um, before giving them um, contrast. So that's the most effective, more than the N-acetylcysteine, more than um, stopping these medications. So it's really just hydrate that's necessary before um, giving, a, giving a patient contrast, if they really need contrast.
So lastly, you don't see muddy brown casts. It's not epithelial cells. You don't see red blood cell casts. It's not uh, glomerulonephritis. It's going to be white blood cells and white blood cell casts. So these um, these correspond to acute interstitial nephritis, abbreviated AIN. This is an inflammatory or allergic reaction in the kidney interstitium. So you'll have these inflammatory cells. So you'll have white blood cells, eosinophils, um, making a mess inside the kidney. This can also be caused by drugs, a different set of drugs. This is usually NSAIDs and sulfa drugs. PPIs can do it here too. So um, I generally think that most antibiotics are in this category, except for the aminoglycosides. Um, there's also deposition disease that causes problems here. So like sarcoid and amyloid can cause acute interstitial nephritis. Um, infections can also cause acute interstitial nephritis, specifically mycoplasma. Um, the treatment here is to essentially remove the offending agent. So um, stop these medications or keep the sarcoid amyloid under control, whether that's dialysis or immunosuppressants or whatever is necessary to control those diseases. So I think that's it for this approach to renal failure. I hope this uh, helped organize the pre-renal, post-renal, and intrarenal causes in your head. Um, thank you for listening.